See a tout. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to this session called Uniting the Scientific Community, What the Global North Can Learn from the South in Research for Development, and I would say in particular related to food and agriculture. It is a distinct pleasure for me uh, as the president of the International Development Research Center based in Ottawa, but over operating across the developing world to welcome, warmly welcome, Isman el -Wafi, the first ever chief scientist of the Food and Agricultural Agriculture Organization of the United Nation, better known under the acronym of the FAO. Welcome, Isman. Thank you very much, Jean. C'est vraiment un grand plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Merci. So Isman, prior to joining the FAO, was the Director General of the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, looking at how to grow crops in a dry environment with uh, salt arising from soil and developing better livelihood for community. She also spent time in Canada, uh, where I met her first in the 90s or early 2000, it must be the early 2000s, when she was advising uh, Agriculture Canada, the Department of Agriculture of the federal government. Um, I want to take note that we're discussing here at the Conférence de Montréal uh, with the chief scientist of FAO and the very special link le, uh, that vu, connect FAO with, you know, the city of <laughs> Quebec, même, Quebec City. In 1945, you know, the first session of the FAO where its constitution was ratified took place in Quebec City. And the chairman of the meeting was our own Lester B. Pearson. It's a long history and tradition. I look back at the mandate and it has not changed. Raise the level of nutrition and standard of living of people. Improve the production and distribution of all food and agriculture products. Improve the condition of the rural population. And what is even more interesting is that I went to the first session and I looked at what were the topics discussed. Nutrition and food management, agriculture, forestry and forest product, fisheries, marketing, and statistics. And that was 76 years ago. So Ismahan, tell me, with these topics, you as a first chief scientist at FAO, what is the role that you are playing now that you have been appointed earlier uh, last year and what you're aiming to accomplish? Thank you very much, John, and thank you for reminding us that we are talking about this subject for a very long time. It's really nice to know that the first time that FAO came to be as an organization of the United Nations was in Quebec City, and the issues were about the same. Maybe the numbers were not. So the chief scientist was created in FAO for the first time because we recognize as an organization that the only way for us to do better this time in the next 10 years. It's really through science and innovation. So we have been always a technical organization. We have a number of experts and we work with so many organizations that generate knowledge and use knowledge. But really, I think we are in a point of a time that necessitates that we do more in terms of science and innovation. So my role as a chief scientist is to bring in more leadership, to bring in a stronger voice of science and innovation so that we achieve our mandate and we achieve our targets, and particularly the SDGs and the Global Development Agenda 2030, and particularly SDG 2, zero hunger and zero poverty, much more quicker. So uh, knowing the area, knowing what's happening, we can't produce more with less unless we use science. So we could produce with much less water, if we use the right methodologies for water management, if we use the right varieties that needs less water, we could produce with less input 
if we use mechanization, innovation, data, and so on and so forth. So I think really the new DG with the new strategic framework that was just approved 2020, 22 to 2030, 31, it's really that we want to have accelerators. And those accelerators, all of them need science. So the four accelerators that we are using to get to our vision, it's data, technology, innovation, and complement. And if you think about it, all these four requires a lot of science and innovation. And, you know, I was planning to talk to you about climate change and COVID right now, but given the answer you provide in me, I'm going to uh, follow a, a different path, but that you're familiar with. The UN, the FAO, is calling for a UN food system summit next week in New York in, the, in parallel with the United Nations General Assembly. So, you know, you're talking about these four elements and we're now talking about food systems. You know, everyone is talking food systems. So can you help our audience to understand how these four elements within the food system concept make it different from what we have done in the past, either improving production, either improving distribution or preservation, either improving nutrition, either improving accessibility and affordability? How does food system change that? So the food system allow us to look at the issue in a holistic way. So I think we, we, we tend to fragment the different things. So we tend to fragment production from the market and the trade. We tend to, to, to not take in consideration infrastructure, logistics, energy, when we talk about agricultural production. So now I think for the first time, we are really talking about the food system and agri-food system. And when you talk about agri-food system, you are not talking about the, the mere production component. You are not talking about just the post-harvest the post storage or processing, but you are talking about the whole thing from the idea or from maybe before, before even the farming component to the table. So I think this holistic allows us to see the complexity of the food system, to understand and also recognize that our food system are not performing at their optimum. So we could see a lot of inefficiencies in the food system and allows us also to bring in the other stakeholders. Even if we talk at the government level, finally, we got the infrastructure ministers with us. We get the energy ministers with us. We get the health ministers with us. So it's, it's more encompassing and more holistic. When we think about outside government, finally, we are recognizing that private sector is a big player there. The consumer, it's a huge player. The smallholder farmers, the, 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 all, all the players, all the actors around the food system have space and has, has a voice. And I think that's what is important if, in this upcoming UN Food System Summit is that finally we are talking about the whole, not the parts. And secondly, we are bringing all the stakeholders, all the actors. And thirdly, we are recognizing more than ever the impacts of climate change, the importance of biodiversity, the importance to align the agendas, because there's a lot of trades off between the different agendas. If we can't really have zero, zero carbon agriculture, if we want to produce more, we can't have nutrition and productivity. So there's a lot of agendas we can't have protect more biodiversity with producing as much as we do now with the same way we do now. So there are trades off and the UN Food System Summit will allow us really to look at it as a whole, recognize the trades off and talk about it. And that's again, another area where science and innovation can help us. If there is anything that can allow us to have a take on the climate change, reducing the carbon, reducing the emission, on biodiversity and on producing, it's really science. It's bringing in science and understanding the issues, understand, recognizing the complexity and finding solutions. And by the end, what we are looking for, and, and that's really, we put it as well, FAO put it very clearly in our strategic framework that was just endorsed by all members, is that we want a better production because we can't forget that we have still 821 million people that, that does not have enough food. 
better nutrition, because finally we recognize as well that the micronutrients are very important, but we have a growing problem with the obesity, a better environment. So we have to know that we are beyond the limits and we need to protect our environment. So finally, we get a better life. By the end, when we look at the poor, the poor people, there are too much within the agriculture sector and mostly producers and smallholder producers in least and middle income countries. And those people need to have a better life, a decent income and a better life. So you set the table talking of food and agriculture with food system. People are not living their life in silos. They are living it globally. The food system approach tried to take this into consideration. We won't get in details of methodologies that would be boring. But there's a, a, an incredible amount of research base that is working on this now. What is the acceptance at the policy level? I imagine quite high, given that there's a UN summit on it. Yes, I, I think really we can finally to talk the same language. I think I, I see really us, if you look at only a few years ago, a, a minister of health wouldn't talk so much to the minister of agriculture. If you look at only a few years ago, again, a ministry of infrastructure might not be so close. So I think really there is a buy-in because finally we recognize all the actors. I think recognizing the actors and recognizing their impact. If we want to really have better nutrition in Africa, for example, we need to address uh, infrastructure. We need to address storage. We need to address energy. So this recognition, I think, brought many, many, many sectors and many and many players and actors together. So I see myself more openness, more interest from all stakeholders uh, and from all sectors. Okay. I'll give you, you know, a negative example. You'll give a positive example. I'll give you the example of what might have happened or what has happened, you know, in the 90s when I was in the field. Um, in Uganda, you know, uh, there was a virus attacking cassava. Cassava is like a potato, it's a, a tuber, a tubercle. And we fix the problem. And, you know, we start to have, you know, fantastic return working with the national authorities, this, uh, the agricultural system of production of cassava. Well, after one season, there were moles of cassava in the field that were rotting. No market, no distribution, no value chain. A perfect illustration that a good idea by scientists about increasing you know, production by fixing the virus problem did not fix the food security problem. Give me an example on how food system approach will or has been demonstrating making a difference. So thank you for that example. And I give you one example with IDRC. Oh, thank you. So it's, it's, yeah. I know we haven't discussed it before, Jean. But uh, there is an example. So many people heard about quinoa. 2013 was the year of quinoa, the international year of quinoa that was hosted by FAO. And what we did, we did a project of introducing quinoa in a marginal environment in Morocco. And that was with, funded by IDRC Canada. And we have as a partner, ICBA, the International Center by Saline Agriculture, FAO, and local organization within Morocco, UN6P and the ministry. And what it happens is that IDRC asks us to look at the value chain. So when you introduce a crop, how would you make sure that the farmers will find a way to sell it? So what we did, and it's because it was designed uh, in, as such, it was designed with the value chain in mind. So we got farmer to produce it. We got a community, a woman cooperative to process it into couscous, into biscuits, into different products. And we got also marketing and market access. And even they got a certification because they did an organic quinoa, they got a certification to export to Europe. So it's, it's really, we have, that's why the food system, it's the right effort. And that's why we are talking about transformation. Because when you look at it as a whole, then you can see the gaps. I always say, it doesn't make sense that we get something produced here and transported thousands of miles to be processed and brought back to be sold in the same market as an add value crop or add value product. So there is inefficiencies. So when we design a program, we have to look at the food 
with system. And we, we do analysis either on the carbon footprint, on the water footprint, on the efficiency of the system, on the inclusiveness of the system. We have to look at it as a whole. And that's where really many of the countries in the least and middle income countries, they have really to look at the whole value and the, the whole value chain, the whole food system. And they have to make sure that they are able to play a part of a larger part of the value chain. So if you are producing it, you should be able to store it. You should be able to process it. You should be able to add value to it because the, this add value component, that's where you get the most return on investment. And we are completely isolating farmers from that component of the value chain of the food system that could allow them to have a better income. Isman, we have 10 minutes left. So we're going to shift gear because, you know, thanks for the example of IDRC, but there's hundreds of other examples from Absolutely. other committed agency and governments. So, you know, uh, I think people can consult numbers of websites to see those. But, you know, I mentioned I was skipping the climate change and COVID. I'm coming back. And I'm going to come back to it with this trend. You know, when you release the report, the World Food Hunger Report this year, there's a graphic that is quite telling about, you know, the number of undernourished people over time. In 2005, you know, we remember that we were very close to a billion people that were going at bed every night, you know, hungry. And we saw, you know, massive investment in agricultural research, intervention, extension services, and this was curbed down, even during the food price crisis in 2008. And, you know, then it started to stagnate, you know, to 600 million people, you know, back in 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. And it stagnated, and we saw also that the investment going to agriculture has started to stagnate also. And now what do we see? For the first time in years, you know, the curve going back up. The stagnation and the curve going back up. What are the role of climate change and the pandemic into this situation? So the big elephant in the room is climate change. There is no doubt about it. And I think if we... If the whole the report that comes from IPCC in 2018, 2019, it's not convincing enough. I think the report that just came out about a month ago from Working Group One is, is just a huge alarm. We're not talking anymore about 1.5 degree. We're most probably talking about two degrees. And the impact of two degrees is just tremendous. And this report, gave much more data than before. It gave much more data, particularly at a regional level. So it, they gave a map, an interactive map, which, whereby you could click and have more data on certain regions, certain countries, certain counties. So absolutely, COVID-19 in my mind, it's a huge crisis, absolutely. But it's a passing by crisis. Climate change is a crisis to stay here. And it's a crisis that we need to address. And the SOFI, as you mentioned, John, the SOFI gave us numbers that are, again, scary. So not only the numbers are going up, but the numbers are going up a lot. So only between 2019 and 2020, we got 161 million more people that are going to bed. Now with COVID-19, COVID and particularly the, the way we, we manage it as well, the fact that we put a lot of restriction in many places because we are putting more emphasis on, on certain aspects in, in our analysis, it's, it's, it's going to affect, we might have another 120 more million people to add to the number 821. So, so the, the climate change and the COVID are both important, but in my mind, and that's my, my own assessment, is that climate change is horrifying climate change will bring us other COVID or other viruses or other insects because what happens with uh, a global warming that is we're talking about 1.5 and 2 and 4 degrees that's the three scenarios that the working group came up with lately is that even with 1.5 the virus movement the insect movement 
the species movement is going to change. So we have to understand it and we have to adapt it. In scenario two, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's very, very disturbing. And that's where that's really... That's the two degrees increase. That's the two degrees increase. So we have really to stop and think about climate change very, very seriously and see what can we do to mitigate, what can we do to adapt. There is a component of mitigation that is very much important in terms of soil and carbon sequestration, forestry, and many others. And there is a component of adaptation that is a must because we can't really back up. 1.5, we could, we could, if we do well, we could contain it at 1.5. If we don't do well, it's going to go more. But in all cases, we need to adapt. And that adaptation is very much needed, particularly in the least and middle income countries, and particularly the least country, least, least income countries, because they don't emit much. They are, they are, they are having the impact, but they are not really emitters in, in, in most of them. In most and, of the and, cases. And I think here, you know, you mentioned we have to stop. I think no. I, I, what you meant is that we have to accelerate. We have to accelerate, you know, the work towards, you know, not only the mitigation, but the adaptation, which is the human component and how we deal with better policy, better investment, better planning on fixing problems related to whatever is the sector, in our case, agriculture, better crop, better agricultural practice, better extension services, better involvement of local community. And there's hundreds of these type of small things that exist around the world, but they need to be captured globally. So what do you and we see? We need scale up, Jean. We need scale up and scale out. And we need proper transformation. And that's why the UN food system is talking about transformation. Because we don't need incremental anymore. We need a really breakthrough and a transformation of the food system. Now, you know, I wouldn't be illegit if I was not to talk about, you know, the differentiated role of women and girls in agriculture. And how does this, I know it's very close to your heart and my heart and the heart of many in the audience, you know. So what needs to be done specifically vis-a-vis -vis this part of the population that is crucial in agriculture? In the developing region, to... as well as in our regions, you know, in developed economies. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, Jean. As you said, uh, when we look at, at, at uh, the, the marginalized people, the people that are the most hurt by climate change and by poverty and by inequalities, Unfortunately, we find most of them are women and girls. And that's why, and also when we look at return on investment, when do you invest in a person and there is a better return investment on the community, you find it's women and girls. And that's where really it's very important that we invest much more, much, much more in women and girls, both in education and in empowering. So women, what they need is opportunities. It's, they, they are empowered by, by nature. So what we need is provide them opportunities to get educated and to choose the path they want and to develop their skills and to help the community because they are carer, they are caregiver by, by nature. And this is, I wouldn't get into the genetic behind it, but most probably it's, it's genetics and it's known. So we need to invest more and we need to bring them options and innovations and solutions that are catered. So. Uh, as you said, John, this is a very close subject to my heart, and I'm really proud that Canada is prioritizing women and girls, because that's what we need. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you for this. Now, do you see differences, you know, very rapidly between Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Latin America? The answer is yes, I guess. But, you know, what are, you know, the priority uno, given that you're in Rome, Rome uh, for each of these regions? Asia. What do you see as a top priority? In Asia, the, I, I see a lot of innovation. Asia, it's one of the countries where you have innovation at the country level, at the formal level. So what, what is needed, it's much more openness to the international market. But sincerely, the model of how innovation is uptake in Asia, be it in, in many countries, it's... Sub-Saharan sub Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa, there is a huge potential there. And the potential has to use more science and innovation. I'm not seeing enough innovation at the farmer level. And there is a huge potential. 
And Africa has to develop its own SMEs. So they have to develop their own private sector, small SMEs with the youth. Africa has youth that nobody has. So Middle that's East what the region is. Middle East and 32nd, you know very well the region. So and Middle North East, Africa. yeah, Middle East, it's, it's unfortunate with what's happening in terms of security and peace. We need stability. And there is a huge potential again in that region. And Latin America? Latin America is, is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's life for me. It's, it's a beautiful place that has great history, but again has maybe uh, got down over the last few years and need to come back with their own niche product, with their own history and their own food and agriculture system. And there's certainly a, a story to tell about the involvement of private sector that has made a huge difference in Latin America and that can be exported to sub-Saharan Africa and adapted. Isman, there's one minute. What do you want the Canadian audience and the international audience to bring back home as the key message of our fireside, fireside so chat? The, the, the main message for me, Jean, is that we need to invest more in science and innovation. We need to invest more to understand nature and to mimic it. We need to invest more in women and girls. And Canada has a miracle in what happened in the prairies 100 years ago. It was bare land and see what it is now. It's the basket. So what Canada have done in its own land, they can help other countries doing it in other. Thank you so much, Ismahan el Chief Scientist of the FAO, first Chief Scientist in position of the FAO. Best of luck in the conduct of your mandate. Audience saw in you, you know, the spirit, the passion, and the knowledge that will animate the function. And so also that numbers of things that happens in development can take roots also into Canada and other economy. We are all facing hardship. The Western Canada situation with forests uh, that are burning or land that is in cross because of the lack of water is no different than what has been seen for many years in many parts of Africa or Asia. It was a pleasure and delight to be with you today. Thank you to Nicolas Remillard and the organizer of La Conférence de Montréal. And thank you all for having been with us for this very exciting, interesting fireside, ch fireside chat conversation with Ismaël El Wafi. Merci beaucoup, Ismaël. Merci beaucoup, Jean. C'était un plaisir. Merci. 